The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to SMRP's webinar. Today, our webinar is titled Reliability Essential for a Safe, Cost-Effective Operation by Ron Moore. Before we start, I would like to quickly go through some housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the SMRP website within 24 business hours for you to download. If you have any questions throughout the web webinar, feel free to ask them through the Q&A section and we'll answer them throughout the presentation. And keep in mind, we will also have some time at the end for remaining questions. So let me introduce our speaker for today. Ron Moore is a managing partner of the RM Group and provides operation excellence, seminars, consulting, cultural change management, and benchmarking services. Ron is the author of Making Common Sense, Common Practice, among several others, and journal articles. He travels worldwide working with industrial and manufacturing operations, helping them improve reliability and achieve operational excellence. And with that, Ron, I will let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody that's joined us uh, and good morning to you. Uh, what I'd like to do in the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour is to share with you data that I've collected from various and sundry industrial and manufacturing operations. Uh, this data comes from, uh, for example, chemicals, steel, food, uh, metals, and so on. It's, uh, it's quite a varied uh, set of data. And by the same token, though, it's all fairly uh, uh, consistent. That is, I haven't cherry-picked the data. And I'm going to share with you a, a, a fraction of the data that I've collected over the years. And I think you'll see that this data demonstrates a, a clear relationship between reliability and safety. So that's what we'll cover today is that, uh, that relationship. And then in the next session, which will be next week uh, at this time, we'll talk about the reliability process and how we achieve reliability and uh, maybe a you know preview of coming attractions. It's not just maintenance. It, in fact, it, uh, the point I try to make is that it requires a heavy focus on design and operations as well. Now, the data I'm going to share with you, uh, I've in some cases, I've put in some correlation coefficients. Just a quick comment, correlation is not cause and effect, but I think you can infer a relationship between the, the parameters I'm gonna share with you. And of course, there are literally hundreds of variables in any given operation that will influence any particular outcome. So, but what I think this will demonstrate is that if you have good reliability, you'll substantially reduce the exposure to the risk of injury. Um, the other point that I want to make to you up front is that there's, at least in my mind, there's a difference between personal safety and process safety. You know, personal safety, you know, PPE, lockout, tagout, and so on. And, and process safety is about how well you design, operate, and maintain the plant. Now those two are related, but simply focusing on one or the other may not get you to the state that you want to be in. And then of course, we'll also talk a little bit about how reliability will also reduce costs and improve environmental performance. So with that said, let's get into the material. Now, as you would know, safety is a top priority for all companies, all the ones I've been exposed to. So most organizations, safety is a top priority. And of course, they've got policies, standards, processes, systems, and so on to support this. And they're committed to enforcing these policies. If I were to come to your operation and uh, didn't wear my safety glasses, didn't adhere to the signage and so on, I feel confident that you would advise me to adhere to your policies. That is, it's not optional. I have to do that. And, and that's a good thing. Yeah. So uh, to uh, support that, of course, everybody has a safety policy statement. You know. So here's an example. I took this from a company and just literally copied it. 
So let's see if it maps into yours or maybe isn't even identical. All injuries are preventable. No task is so urgent that it cannot be done safely. Management must provide a safe workplace. And we are each responsible for preventing injuries. And finally, everyone is empowered to stop unsafe behavior. Most of you have something very similar to that. Now, I'm gonna come back to this statement in just a bit and offer a policy statement that links reliability and safety. It'll be very similar to this, but we're gonna add a phrase to each one of these statements. So, now, if executives were truly committed to safety, and I think most are, I don't have any doubt about that, but if they were, they would also be committed to reliability. And they would have similar policies, standards, processes, and systems. I found that to be lacking in most organizations I've been in. Why is that? Well, I think typically they don't understand the relationship between reliability and safety, nor do they understand how to achieve reliability. And we'll talk about that in more detail in the next session next week, but I'll give you an introduction to that at the end of this session. Now, let's look at some case studies and some data. Here's, uh, well, before we get to this particular case study and the, another one following it, uh, let me just point out that BP has learned from these accidents and uh, most managers, I think all managers within BP are required to go through some case studies, case histories, and, and to have a fairly in-depth review of this so that they minimize the risk of, the, of this in the future. So with that said, Here's BP Texas City. They blew it up. This is a refinery. They were celebrating a safety award the day of the disaster. 15 people died. This next one, if you all recall, the Deepwater Horizon disaster. There were two VPs aboard the platform that morning presenting a safety award. 11 people died. ICI, Imperial Chemicals, had very good safety performance and went out of business. Hmm. All this is, I'm sure, interesting. So what does this say? And just to pose an open-ended question, what does this say about their reliability? <clears throat> Maybe their operating practices. Maybe, and we'll come to this in just a bit, the difference between personal and process safety. What do they all have in common? You know, what's driving all this? Well, without answering those questions specifically, let's look at some data. Let's look at the relationship between reliability and safety, and of course, costs and environmental incidents. So here's data, I've got six or seven of these. This is data from a large US manufacturer, roughly 10 billion a year in sales, you know, multiple plants you know, across the country. On the left-hand axis, we've got injury rate as a percent of some base number. That is, I took the highest number and divided that into all the other numbers. And over here on the right axis, we've got OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, effectiveness, you know, a percent of the maximum capability that they achieve on a routine basis. <clears throat> and likewise, you know, I've taken one number and divided it into all the other numbers to get a percentage of the change over time. And this is over a five year period. So I think it's pretty obvious, should be, that these patterns are the reciprocal of one another. That is when the plant is running well, injury rates low, when it's running poorly, injury rate is high. So if the plant's running well, there's a substantial reduction in the risk of injury. So here's some more data. This is data of total injuries per year on the vertical axis. Now, total injuries includes first aids. So it, it includes the band-aids and this flick in your eye and that sort of thing. On the horizontal axis, we've got 
corrective and reactive work orders per year, per year, over an eight year period. And I've got three of these and they follow this same pattern. That is the more reactive and corrective work you do, the greater the risk of injury. And by the way, the more corrective reactive work you do, the lower your OEE and the higher your costs. We'll come to that in just a bit. Now, this next chart is that same plant, only this time, same operation, only this time we're looking at PM and PDM work orders per year. That is work that's planned and scheduled and, you know, statistically speaking, more in control and capable. And of course, as we can see, the more of this kind of work you do, the lower the risk of injury and the lower the costs and the higher the OEE. So this next set of data, we've got injury rate on the vertical axis, maintenance schedule compliance on the horizontal axis. And this is, I think, for a smelter or a mining operation. And I don't remember which one now, but, you know, same pattern. That is, the better your schedule compliance, the lower the risk of injury. Now, I do have one caution on this chart. You can have good schedule compliance. Uh, just don't schedule much work. You know, hold 20, 30 percent of your work, uh, hold, of your available resources, hold them back because they may have to go do reactive work. So just have to be a little bit careful. I think you should schedule 100 percent of the hours available. But allow for breaks into the schedule. That two things will happen. You'll get more work done because people expect to do more work and you'll make more thoughtful decisions about breaking into the schedule about whether or not you need to do that or, or not. So I would encourage you to adopt that approach. Schedule 100% of your workforce available and allow breaks to the schedule. This next one's on environmental incidents per year. And I've got a couple of these. Vertical axis, number of incidents. Horizontal axis, asset utilization. And again, this you take one number and divide it into the other numbers to get the percent improvement over time. Right here at the maximum incidents, they were threatened with uh, suspension of their license to operate. And over time, they began to improve their reliability. And of course, as you can see here, as they improve that, they got better asset utilization, they got lower costs, and they got better environmental conformance. This next set slide is uh, on the vertical axis, we've got OEE. On the horizontal axis, we've got the level of reactive maintenance over time. And this is the at least squares regression of data from 180 manufacturing plants. So it's pretty obvious here that the more reactive you are, the lower your OEE. Now, this is mostly process plants. Uh, I've got more anecdotal, not quite as comprehensive as this, for discrete plants, batch plants, and you know, automotive food and the like. They tend to run you know, something on the order of down about 10 points lower than this. This next data is data from the University of Tennessee Reliability Maintainability Center headed up by Klaus Blake. He did, he surveyed a bunch of plants. Here's injury rate on the vertical axis. And we got three data points. We've got the best quartile, the middle half, and then the worst quartile. So it's pretty obvious here, I think, that, by the way, it's the average of those in those groups. So the more reactive you are, the higher the risk of injury. This next set of data, similarly, only this is maintenance costs as a percent of asset replacement value. The more, and this is the average in the four quartiles. So the more reactive you are, the higher your costs. Now, this next set of data is production cost. You know, not maintenance, this is dollars per unit. This is a huge US company, uh, several billion dollars per year, multiple, each one of these dots is an operation, a plant. You know? So here we've got the production costs 
plotted as a function of a thing called the reliability index. Now this index is a composite of design operations and maintenance practices, along with some other things like procurement stores and a little bit on management uh, practices, uh, culture, that sort of thing. So this index is not just maintenance, it's really a composite of a bunch of practices. <clears throat> and what we can see, of course, is that the higher your index, the lower your costs. Now, a couple of points about this data. Let's, let's come up here to where they closed that plant. Well, why did they close it? Well, it's pretty obvious. Their costs were too high. You know? And the folks there didn't believe it was ever gonna happen. And it did. Another point I'd make to you, let's take a couple of data points here. Let's take this one right out here. And then let's start back and take this one here. And the one on the left that I've got the arrow pointed to, their practices are pretty ordinary. You know? The one on the right, their practices are pretty good. Maybe not quite top quartile, but really quite good. So what, what do you think might be going on? Well, if I were with you, I'd be asking you guys some questions to see what you thought might be going on. But since I'm not, I'm just gonna give you an answer. These guys here, they have pretty low costs, but they have a long-term low energy contract, which is a big percentage of their costs. And they're at the mine mouth, which makes their transportation costs for raw material quite cheap. These guys aren't, but they still have the same costs. I believe that these guys here over on the left ought to be down in this top quartile. And if I were the boss, I'd make that clear to them and then have them present a plan to me on how they're gonna achieve that. So enough said on that. Well, let's go to the next one, next set of data. Here's some more uh, data, more anecdotal. DuPont reported the most likely person to be injured is a maintenance technician with less than two years experience doing reactive work. That reactive work comes up time and again in all these studies. Just a, a comment here, additional training and procedures may mitigate this risk. Yep. In fact, I've got some other data that says uh, uh, apprenticeship programs will mitigate this risk and lack of apprenticeship programs will increase the risk. ExxonMobil, of course, reported accidents are five times more likely in maintenance when doing breakdown work versus planned and scheduled. And Krista Idhammer reported in 66% of the company surveyed, 60% of the injuries occurred while doing reactive maintenance. So I think the case is fairly compelling here. And so let's carry on. Here's a thing called a reliability pyramid. Um, this is put together by a friend of mine, Winston Leday, uh, ex DuPont guy working developed a manufacturing game. He says, and he's got data to support this, for every 20,000 defects, you'll have 6,500 repair work orders, and that'll result in 10 significant losses and ultimately one major incident. You know? So uh, defects create repairs, losses, and major incidents. So how, how, how many people does it take to get rid of 20,000 defects? Well, everybody has to eliminate the defects to reduce that risk of repairs and incidents. So, and we'll come back to this one. I'm gonna link this one, which is really kind of more focused on equipment. We'll link this over to the process reliability pyramid momentarily. So point of all this, Safety and reliability, I think, is really a question of leadership. Leaders understanding the relationship and putting in place the processes, the practices, and so on that support it. The safety manager cannot make the plant safe. They support it. Safety is, of course, everyone's responsibility. Well, the reliability manager, or in some cases, maintenance manager, cannot make the plant reliable. They can support it. I would you know, suggest to you, reliability is like safety. It's everyone's responsibility. We all have a role to play, and I'll share some data with you in the next session 
on that. So what's the implication of all this? Well, how about a policy linking reliability and safety? If safe behavior is a requirement, and it is, and you've got specific standards for that, and they're not optional, then operational excellence is a requirement, and you have specific standards for operations and maintenance, and they're not optional. Now, you probably want to have the operating and the maintenance folks help you develop those standards so they have a sense of ownership and purpose and all that. So if you believe in zero incidents and injuries, might be an aspirational goal, then likewise, aspirationally speaking, you must believe in zero failures and unplanned downtime. So now given this, operations and maintenance training should be on a par with safety training. In most of the operations I've been in, almost all of them, safety training is given a really high priority. And that's a good thing. But what is sometimes lacking is training your folks, your operators and your maintainers to do a superb job, giving them the skills, upgrading their skills, developing them with the appropriate skills to minimize the risk of failure. So that probably needs some attention in most organizations. Getting both reliability and safety requires operational discipline. That is the tenacious, tenacious use of best practices in all areas. So now here's a couple of cautions. Here's the first one. Personal safety and process safety are not the same. That is, you can have excellent personal safety and still go out of business. Major chemical company, I see, I have a major accident, BP. Personal safety is improved by discipline use of PPE, lockout, tagout, vessel entry, all that sort of thing, personal behavior. And that's all good stuff. Process safety, I would submit to you, is improved by the disciplined design, operating, and maintenance practices, including, as necessary, a process hazards analysis. And again, getting both personal and process safety requires operational discipline. That is the tenacious use of best practice in all areas. So here's the second caution. Focusing on safety and safe practices will improve safety for sure, but only to a point. You must reduce the exposure to the risk of injury. So here's a case study on the left on the vertical axis, we have lost time accident rate over several years, about 10 years. So these guys initiated a safety initiative in year one, and over about five years or so, they had a dramatic improvement in their lost time accident rate, and that's great. And then for the next five years, it just kind of bounced around. It, it was very good, it was better than average, not world-class, but better than average but they just couldn't seem to get any better than that. And I would submit to you that that's because you had achieved all you could achieve with your safe personal safety practices. That is PPE, lockout, tag up, personal behaviors and all that sort of thing. What you have to do is reduce the process and the equipment failures so that you reduce the exposure to the risk of injury. And then you get even better performance. So here's Andrew Hopkins. He wrote a book called Failure to Learn, and he, he offered this as a process safety pyramid, that is minor process errors, and he's got some examples in there, result in process safety breaches, you know, and he's got some examples there, result in loss of containment, and ultimately a major accident. So that's what he calls a process safety pyramid. So I'd like to put those two together. That is, the more defects you have, the more process errors you can have, the more process errors you can have, the more defects you have. But either way, you're gonna have a major incident or a major accident. And they influence each other. So what's the implication of all this? Well, I think the implication is that design procurement production and maintenance have to work collectively to minimize the risk 
of these process errors, of these defects. And again, operational discipline is essential to eliminate the defects and the process errors. So here's some, uh, you know, a way of thinking about reliability. In fact, we'll come back to this in just a minute with a little bit different model. But this is uh, most people have, you know, have seen or heard of or observed the Swiss cheese model. So we have design, buy, store, install, and start up, operate, and maintain. And if we have defects or holes in our processes in any of these areas, we increase the risk of big bad things happening. So we might have a small initiating event back in this sequence somewhere, and the more holes we have in our system, the greater the risk. Now what that says is we must do all these things really well to minimize the risk of loss. In fact, we have to work together to understand where those risks are. So with all that said, I wanna offer you a revised policy statement that links reliability and safety. So all injuries and failures are preventable. By the way, failures, uh, you know, you can do an RCM or FMEA analysis and conclude that a particular failure is of little consequence. Well, that's not really a failure. You know, you intended to run the equipment that way. So that's okay. Anyways, all injuries and failures are preventable. No task is so urgent it cannot be done safely and reliably. Management must provide a safe and reliable workplace we're each responsible for preventing injuries and failures, and everyone is empowered to stop unsafe, unreliable behavior. So I would offer you that as a model for putting in place a policy statement that ties together reliability and safety, particularly given the data that I just shared with you. Another set of thoughts, you know, most of you have been through a uh, some sort of safety initiative. And, you know, if you, if you look at the steps you went through to drive safety, they're the same steps to drive reliability. That is top-down leadership, clear, consistent expectations, bottom-up ownership and employee engagement, education and training, action plans, measures, visual communication standards and procedures, benchmarking and aggressive goals, audits and assessments, you know, a root cause analysis process to eliminate repeat failures, rewards, and a willingness to challenge non-compliance. I'm sure you have that. Resources for supporting the improvement and a continuous improvement expectation and process so that it becomes a culture that is a way of life, an ethos, if you will. So now I wanna introduce you to what I call the reliability process, and we'll get more into that in the next session. Um, a commitment to safety requires a co-commitment to reliability and the related policies and practices. And I believe, in fact, I'm absolutely convinced of it, it should be given as much executive attention as any recommendations from any high-powered consulting companies. You know, most of these major companies, they'll bring in, you know, a, I won't mention names, but they'll bring in a high-powered consultant and they will really pay attention to that person or that company. And then for the most part, they try to do what they've suggested. Well, I think this data we just shared and the reliability process should receive at least as much attention as those folks, not to their exclusion, but should be on a some sort of comparable basis. So that said, here's the Swiss cheese model, uh, reconfigured, different kind of model. Instead of having holes, we've got buckets of defects in the what I call the reliability process. So let's have a quick look at this, and we'll do this in more detail in the next session. Design for life cycle cost. Most companies I've been around don't do that. In fact, they design for 
you might argue, lowest installed cost. Well, that's not an absolute truth, but it happens, uh, you know, they lean in that direction rather than the life cycle cost. Why is that? Well, at one point in my career, I was the VP of projects. And the two things that drove my behavior more than anything else were budget and schedule. Now, of course, you had specifications. Of course, you had objectives. Of course, you had you know system standards and all that sort of thing. But the things that drove me were budget and schedule. And once that was set, I was driven to meet it. And I really didn't think too much down the road. You know, my objective was to get the pass the acceptance testing and be done and move to my next project. So unless we change the incentives, that's probably not going to change very much. You know? Let's talk about buy. Buy a concept there is total cost of ownership. Well, it's kind of like life cycle cost, just restated. You know? uh, a story I tell to illustrate that is the guy is a guy, he had a new pair of shoes on. And he met his friend on the street. And his friend says, nice shoes, how much did they cost you? And the guy says, I don't know. I haven't finished wearing them yet. So he knew what he paid for them. But if they wore out tomorrow, it cost him a lot. But if they lasted 10 years, it didn't cost him very much. And it's a similar concept as life cycle cost, total cost of ownership, which of course includes operating and maintenance costs and performance capability and all that sort of thing not just the price. Run your storeroom like a store, like a business, like you care, you know? And most folks don't do that either. Install and start up with discipline. Your highest risk of inducing defects and failures is indeed at startup. And we'll show you the data in the next session. So you have to be really good at your fabrication, your installation, your startup, your commissioning, because that's a real high risk period. Operate with care and maintain with precision. Now, these defects are at the root cause of my rate losses, my downtime, my unnecessary work, my injuries and environmental incidents, all that sort of thing. But notice the characterization I've got up above. These three boxes of defects are bigger than these other three. And of course, my point there would be that these have more influence on your reliability than do the other three. And I've got data to support that, and we'll cover that next time. So what's the implication of that? Well, if you want really good reliability, where would you start? Well, most of you would say over in design, that's where reliability begins. Well, most of you have, you have what you have. So it's going to be really hard to change the design at this point. You might do it over time and influence some minor capital projects to change the design somewhat. So given that, where would you start your reliability process, your focus, who should lead it? Well, I would submit to you that it's operations. And we'll come back to that next time. I think it should be driven by operations, led by operations with maintenance and support. To do otherwise, it's a little bit, you know, having your um, reliability process driven by maintenance is a little bit like expecting the mechanic at the garage to own the reliability of your car. Who owns the reliability of your car? Well, of course you do. Of course you need a good mechanic. You know, you need to be able to get your PMs done, to get repairs done and so on. But if you don't take care of that vehicle, and if it's not designed right, it will not provide you with the service you expect at a low cost. And of course, the point of all this is doing better maintenance will not contribute much to reliability. It will contribute some. Now, just to caution you, do you need good maintenance? Well, of course you do, because you still got to manage the defects. They're coming at you. So you got to have really good maintenance, but it has to be worked in concert with operations 
and to some extent with design. So the operations and maintenance folks are going to go back and help drive changes in the design or to procurement or stores. So with all that said, that's going to uh, conclude today's session. Next time we're going to go into each one of these and we're going to reflect on each one of these elements and then following that we'll look at the strategy for implementation and some organizational issues around management support, plant culture, organizational alignment, and so on. We'll, besides these six elements, we'll also look at the soft stuff, which is the hard stuff in most organizations. So I'll pause there and, <clears throat> excuse me, turn it back to Jess to see if we have any, we finished up a little bit early, so next time we probably won't because I've got more to cover in the next session, but this made a natural break point. So Jess, I'm going to turn it back to you. Do we have any questions or comments from anybody? Yeah, great, Ron. Um, again, just if anyone has any questions, you can ask them through the Q&A section. And it looks like we do have a few coming in. Um, someone asked on slide 20, what do you mean by losses? Uh, you let me go back to 20. I don't have these things memorized. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, what do I mean by on slide 20? Oh, large production. Well, a ma yes. yeah. One major incident, uh, for, this is from Winston's slide on equipment, mostly focused on equipment. Uh, losses would be a large production loss or a lost time accident. You know, it would be uh, generally focused on the downtime, the production losses, but it also includes having uh, you know, a major incident like a lost time accident, or maybe even a death. All right, great. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Ron? Um, and again, the presentation is recorded and will be uploaded on the SMRP website within 24 business hours. So if you want to go back and listen, you can as well. I have put the presentation in the handout section. So if you would like a copy of the PDF version of this PowerPoint presentation, you can go to the handout section and grab that as well. No questions, boy. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. I usually get a few here and there. Um, one, you know, one thing we can do if you want, I'm just going to drop back down. We could get into the material for the next section because it's longer. Can we do that? Yeah, if you Hopefully. would like to continue for the next yeah. uh, okay. few minutes. Um, before we do that, I do have one question that just came okay. in. What does your experience show is the largest barrier to making improvement in their facility? Leadership. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a blunt or abrupt answer, but if, if the leadership of the organization has bought into this data and these principles, it's far more likely to happen than if they have not, or if they give it lip service and then ignore it. So that's, and we'll, we'll come back to that next time. Uh, so the leadership has to understand and drive this process. The second thing that is uh, telling is, whether or not you have a uh, production and maintenance partnership, one that's led by production, that is production takes a lead responsibility for reliability, and then they work with maintenance. And they have some shared measures like maintenance and production are both responsible for maintenance and repair costs and maintenance schedule compliance and production schedule compliance. So if you have a good production maintenance partnership where they have some shared measures to facilitate that increases likelihood of success. And the last element is having a shop floor engagement process, structured improvement time. Once a week you pick something, maybe it's a procedure, maybe it's a piece of equipment and you put together cross functional teams to address those, to make them right, to improve them. So the, the three big ones and the number one is leadership 
executive sponsorship that provides the resources, the time, the expectations, and so on. So that number one is a leadership executive sponsorship. Number two is a production maintenance partnership with some shared measures to facilitate collaboration. And number three is a shop floor engagement process, structured improvement time. So that's the longer version of the answer. Perfect, thank you, Ron. We do have a few more coming in. Um, how do you get operators and maintenance personnel on the same page to tackle reliability? Yeah, uh, well, I just I just mentioned it. Um, you get you have structured improvement time wherein you use cross-functional teams to address something. Where I've seen this very successfully used uh, any number of times, really is for example, maybe you've got a, uh, a pumping station that's kind of knackered, it's busted, it's just not working well and you're having frequent repairs. Take some time, spend a day with a cross-functional team, having them clean and inspect the pumps and the equipment around that. As they clean, they inspect, as they inspect, they detect, as they detect, they can correct. You want them to work together to restore that station to like new condition. And once you get it like new, you keep it that way. You know, you take pride in it. So having these, you know, cross-functional teams to address these, you know, problematic uh, equipment or problematic issues, I think is, Right, right up there at the top. Now, before you do that sort of a exercise, you probably ought to have them sit down and talk about what are some of the issues, what are some of the problems, what are some of the things that need to be done before you actually get into that cross-functional team going out there and addressing the equipment. So I've, I've seen that used very successfully several times. Hey, great. And that, another question. By the way, that's where the that's where the leadership and the operations manager, you know, they set the expectation, they provide the resources, they provide the time for people to do the improvements. And it, but if they don't do that, if the leadership doesn't do that, and the production and maintenance guys don't provide the time to do that, it won't happen. So those are kind of first order of business. And then you go to the, you know, the cross-functional team approach. Okay, next one. Um, this is a two-part question. Do you have any model to get operation and maintenance working together instead of complaining and blaming each other? Um, and that gotcha. second part is how can we engage these functions for the shared purpose? I, I think we just discussed it. <laughs> okay. So the, the leadership has to make it clear to the production guy that I'm holding you responsible for reliability. This is not just a maintenance thing. I'm holding you responsible for that. And to the maintenance guy, I'm holding you responsible to support that. And then having those shared measures that they work together on and you know, setting that expectation. Now, I, I do have a, a, a partnership agreement, okay, that you could use as a model to create that sense of, uh, uh, purpose and ownership and partnership. And um, I'll send that to you, Jess, and, and you can share it with folks. I have I have no problem sharing that. And then you could, I'm not saying you ought to follow this model exactly, but you ought to use it as a framework for achieving that, okay? I'll send that to you after this, after this session. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, great. Thanks, Ron. Um, few more that just came in. How do you see TPM implementation on getting maintenance and operation teams working together? Is this a good choice? Uh, it can be if it's properly implemented. You know, you got to understand the basic tenets of TPM. And it's not just operator care. Okay, that's a key element of it, of course. But in a TPM model, uh, maintenance is about maintaining equipment and plant function. It's not about fixing stuff. In a TPM model, 
you're going to measure and you're going to manage your OEE, that is all losses from ideal. You are going to have operator care and development. You are going to have good maintenance planning and scheduling and good condition monitoring. You're going to do all those things if you have a proper TPM model. But there's something more to it than just that. And another point about TPM is that 5S is a prerequisite for properly doing TPM. And I want to say that again, 5S is a prerequisite because 5S, if you do it properly, requires the use of some of these cross-functional teams. It requires that you uh, look after stuff within your plant. Um, just a quick comment on 5S. Uh, it's the, the 5S is our sort, straighten, sort, scrub, straighten, systematize, and standardize. And most people do the first three and then they stop. They don't systematize, they don't standardize so that they sustain. And six months later, everything just kind of falling apart again. So you've got to systematize and standardize. And there are variations on those words, I understand that. But if you're going to do TPM, start with 5S, then go to and apply all the basic tenets of TPM, measure your OE, manage your losses. Maintenance is about maintaining plant function, which means operations and maintenance have to work together. Yeah, of course, you have the operator care piece. You have the PM, PDM, and planning. It also includes equipment, or rather maintenance prevention in the design. Maintenance prevention in the design. And it includes developing, training, developing, and upskilling your people. So if you're gonna do TPM, you have to understand it and you have to make sure you apply all the principles in an appropriate order. It's a long answer for a short question. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> um, okay, so Ron, next question is, what should you do when you find yourself in an organization that does not encourage or believe in operator care? Uh, quit. <laughs> I don't mean that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I've, next time I'm going to share some data with you on operator care. Uh, in, in fact, let me just, let me drop down and I'll pop that up here right now. Uh, there it is. This is data, for, again, from University of Tennessee, the Reliability Center, Klaus Blake. Um, so you, you might be able to take this and go back and convince somebody of this. You know, level one, here's maintenance costs on the vertical axis. Horizontal axis is level of operator care. Level one is none. Level two is some. Level three is regular. And level four is regular PM checks and some repairs. That is, now just have a look at that. Yeah, there's some variation in here, but have a look at that. Which one of those would you rather have? Well, it's a pretty obvious business case here for having operator care. Now, in some cases, you've got some union issues about, you know, operators don't do maintenance. Well, go back and read the contract because a lot of these contracts allow for some degree of operator care, and you ought to understand what that is. And then you go through an analysis of what would make sense for them to do. You know, what makes sense? I don't know. And you just have them have a look at it. Cross-functional team, operators, maintainers, and engineer. And for the moment, you know, just say, well, look, let's set the contract over here and let's look at what makes sense. And once you do analyze what makes sense, given all their other duties, you go back to the contract and you say, well, is it allowed by the contract? If it's not, you negotiate. If it is, you do it. So, and last point I'd make here, you know, it's a quote from my mother. That is, take care of the place where you make your living. So it will take care of you. You know, I've never understood people that come to work and don't have this attitude, don't have this view. Because that job, that process, that equipment is making it possible for you to pay your mortgage, 
for you to put food on the table for your kids to make your car payments and go on vacation. Why wouldn't you take care of it? So that's my answer. So this question kind of ties in, and I know you just briefly talked about it, but how do you improve that operator care mindset? And what's well, the way to implement that? Yeah, let's go back to the uh, the beginning. Um, I think, you know, there's some data, Klaus Blake has some data that says 70% of all improvement ideas come from the shop floor. Well, you got to go to the guys running the equipment and, and ask them what's bothering you, what is an aggravation, what's keeping you from doing your job, what's causing quality problems, what's causing loss production, get them involved in helping you identify where the issues are and then get them involved on a cross-functional team to get that corrected. You know, you know, you don't get ownership by going out and saying, you know, show some ownership here, damn it. You get ownership by getting the folks doing the work to help you identify the work and then getting them involved and helping you make the corrections and the improvements to the work. So it requires much more of an engagement process for the shop floor to accomplish that. And if you involve them in creating the procedures, the standards, the checklist, you know, whatever it is, then they'll have a sense of control, a sense of purpose, a sense of ownership for that, particularly if they do a good job and you make sure they know how pleased you are that they've done such a great job. So that requires leadership to be out there on the floor talking to folks. You know, if you want to know about the problems with the work, talk to the workers and get them involved in helping you. And that goes back to the leadership creating an environment where that's routine. I've, I've said enough. <laughs> All right, great. Um, we do have a few more questions and then um, we can wrap it up. But um, okay. someone is asking, can you clarify more as to why doing more maintenance will not improve reliability? Well, doing more maintenance will improve reliability some. Okay, Having planning and scheduling, having condition monitoring, having those things will improve your reliability some. You'll get notionally somewhere around 2% improvement in uptime and maybe a, a few percentage points reduction in maintenance costs. But the point I would make to folks is that if the defects coming into the maintenance process overwhelm the process, you can't really do much in maintenance. You got to stop the defects because, you know, and, and I'm sure it's happened to at least some of you out there, you know, you, you work real hard and you put together a condition monitoring program, you buy a Maximo or whatever, SAP, and you put together planning and scheduling and so on, and you put the plans together one week, and then what happens? What happens Monday morning, Sunday night? What happens Monday night, Tuesday morning? What happens? And so on. So if the defects coming at you overwhelm your ability to properly apply the systems you put in place, you're not going to get much improvement. You'll get some, but you got to stop the defects up in the way you operate the plant, the way you have your spare parts managed, the way you design the plant and so on. So I'm not, I am absolutely not saying you don't need good maintenance systems. Of course you do. You need all that stuff, but you can't let the total number of defects overwhelm your ability to apply those tools. And that requires a cooperative, collaborative relationship with production and with design and procurement. Okay, I've said enough. Um, on the question. And that goes, sorry, that goes back to leadership setting the expectation for that. So, all right. Great. Uh, there's a question that kind of ties into what you were just talking about. Um, so someone is asking, how do you eliminate defect with the lowest cost? Well, the, first of all, you have to identify the defects. And how do you identify the defects? You, 
you know, remember I said this earlier, 70% of the improvement opportunities are gonna come from the shop floor. So you gotta have some sort of process to engage them. Some of these defects are gonna be relatively minor. They won't be worth you know, looking at. Some of them will be major. One of the processes that I use, uh, and it's at the risk of steering you towards my book, um, is a, what I call a business level failure modes and effects analysis, where you define a functional failure in your business system as anything that results in loss of production or extraordinary costs. And you put a team together, you have them go through and ask that question about a particular area or a particular process. Every step through that process, you take that information in terms of what's it costing me, and you prioritize that. Things that are easy to do and have real high return or real high value, you do first. Things that are harder to do and have lesser value, you do second and so on. So there's a, there's a decision-making model that you use. And fundamentally, things that are easy to do and have real high value get done first. Things that are easy to do and have less value get done second. Things that are hard to do but have high value get done third, usually require a team of people to address those. And things that don't have much value and are hard to do usually don't get done. So you gotta go through some sort of review but that review and analysis has to involve the guys on the floor who know where the problems with the work are. I believe that, I'm convinced of it. All right, great. Um, I think we can do one or two more. So what okay. steps should you follow or take to make the production fall in line or fall in with first line maintenance? And another part is what level of first level maintenance the production should be involved in? Well, I'm gonna answer the second question first. You get the production guys to help you and them decide what makes sense. I said this earlier. And usually it's simple tasks. You know, it's, it's doing, you know, maybe maintenance helper work. Maybe it's doing simple calibrations, you know. Maybe it's you know doing cleaning. You know, think of think of the tasks that a maintenance helper would do, and get the guys that are operating the equipment to think about: Does it make sense for them to do that? Does it make sense for them, for example, just take out a screwdriver and tighten a nut, or rather tighten a screw, or take out a wrench and tighten a bolt? Does it make sense for the do, them to do that? Is that allowed by the contract? If it's not, what do you got to do to make it allowed? What are you going to do to involve them in helping you identify the problems and making the decisions around that and then work in that direction? And it won't be easy for the most part. It might be a little difficult here and there, but you got to make a start somewhere. And you know, one more time, that's why the leadership of the organization has to set the expectation and work through that. So what was the first question? Uh, what steps would you follow or take to make the production fall in with first line maintenance? Well, again, that goes back to the issue of having some sort of production and maintenance partnership and the leadership setting the expectation that production is going to be held responsible for the reliability of the equipment. You know, the next time I'll share with you some data that says something on the order of two thirds of your production losses have nothing to do with equipment. Of the one third that is equipment related, something on the order of two thirds of that is caused by poor operating practice, which means maintenance only controls about 10% of your production losses. Now you need to go back and look at your data. It may be one third, one third, one third. I don't know, but in most plants, maintenance does not control the production output. Production does, and maintenance doesn't control the reliability equipment. Design and production do. So you need to develop some data around your OEE measure to understand where those losses are occurring and put together a business case that says, hey, Here's where most of the opportunity is, and here's why we need your help 
in addressing some of these issues, and we will work with you to support that. I hope that made sense. I rattled on a bit. Perfect. Thank you, Ron. All right, everyone. So it looks like we're hitting that hour mark, and I would like to wrap things up. Um, it looks like we did get a lot of questions about the presentation and the slides. So again, this, this was recorded and it will be up on the SMRP website within 24 business hours. And um, the handout section has the slides, but if you uh, cannot find it or do not see it, then you can email Ron or myself and we can get those slides to you. All right, so I would just like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. And Ron, again, thank you for your time. And we will do the second part of this webinar um, again at the same time next week. Yeah, next Wednesday. So thank you guys for coming. I hope, you know, if, if I didn't answer your question effectively, with my response today, you know, feel free to, you know, think about it and come back at me again next week or feel free to give me a call. So. All right. All right, guys. You. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. And have a great rest of your day. Bye.